Hello, I'm Dr. Daria Brzezinski, and you are watching What Wise Women Want, here on Charlottesville's Public Access Comcast Channel 13. Every week, we bring you panels of women who discuss, I hope, interesting topics to you. Ladies, we're 52% of the population with 85% of the purchasing power. Let's use that power to make informed choices for ourselves, our community, our families, and all those around us. You can visit more and learn more about our panelists on our website, www.whatwisewomenwant.com, and wise is spelled with a Z. There you'll find each one of our panelists and a little bit of information about them, as well as contact information. We give you this information far enough advanced so that you can send in questions, and we will be happy to ask those questions on future programs. Also, you can see the women who have been on former programs in the past. Tonight we're going to be talking about a topic that I think is near and dear to many people, especially including myself, and that is caring for aging parents, spouses, and adults. I, too, have been touched by having to care for an elderly father and some elderly friends who, who have um, most recently died, and I thought this might be a topic that would be of interest to many of you. Our panel this evening are four amazing women who represent our community with regard to the elderly and taking care of people who are ill and hoping to keep them in their homes, if not in institutions and places in order to be able to help them. To my right is our first uh, guest, who is Susan Van Hermert? Von Hemert. Hemert, Von Hemert. I have it written wrong. Um, she is manager social services at Blue Ridge Pace. To her right is Susan Seidler, who is manager of community relations at Java. To her right is Christine Shaw, Community Service Representative for Home Instead Senior Care. And to her right is Susan Lieberman of Senior Solutions, who owns Senior Solutions and is a geriatric care per person. So ladies, um, I'm not sure that everyone knows the various uh, places you represent. So, and you know, we were using an acronyms like JABA and PACE. So I think what we might do is to go around and ask each one of you to describe the place where you work and perhaps very briefly as we go around to discuss what it is that your place does. Absolutely. Susan. PACE stands for Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly. And it's new to Charlottesville. As a matter of fact, we have our grand opening on March 1st, um, which is going to be a wonderful celebration. And um, PACE brings uh, a, a something that works in collaboration with all the agencies in the community. Uh, with Riverside Health, with JAVA and UVA, we've created this program. And all-inclusive means that um, that a person can come to this PACE Center and they can receive their health care, their therapy, they can see a social worker, a chaplain, they can go to our adult daycare area and have meaningful social activities, they can have hot meals, they can go to the game room and play Wii, and all of this is under one roof. And the hope is that caregivers who are attempting to take care of their loved ones at home and are reaching a place where they're not sure if they can do it anymore, that they're going to find this as a relief for them. Their loved one gets their transportation taken care of. They can come to the center for the whole day, for two days, four days, five days a week, while the caregiver takes care of themselves. A lot of children have to work, and a lot of spouses just need a break. So. Thank you. Susan, tell us a little bit about JABA. Okay. JABA is the Jefferson Area Board for Aging. It's a local area agency on aging, serving seniors, caregivers, and other community members. There were 25 area agencies on aging in Virginia, and JABA serves Charlottesville, Albemarle, Fluvanna, Green, Louisa, and Nelson. And we provide some direct services ourselves, information and assistance, case management, home delivered meals, community centers, health services, and so on. And then we refer people to other community resource providers. Okay, Christine. 
Thank you. Uh, well, Home Instead pretty much is just like the title says. Home Instead Senior, senior Care aims to help seniors age in place, uh, gives them an opportunity to stay safe and independent in their own homes. So it's not a place like Java or Pace. It's an opportunity to be safe and independent through the aging process. We have caregivers that are our employees that help out with everything that you would expect a family member to help you out with. And that could be making meals, driving to doctor's appointments, medication reminders, cleaning the house, changing the sheets, doing laundry, but also taking care of personal care needs such as bathing, feeding, clothing, incontinence management, transference. So everything that um, a person would need in order to maintain their independence at home, sometimes through the aging process, they need to have a little bit of help. For example, if they're transitioning from the hospital, it may be very difficult for them to drive like they used to, or even cook nutritious meals, or even do the laundry for that matter. So we come in to help them maintain their independence at home through that recuperation process. Excellent. Susan. Senior Solutions of Charlottesville is um, a geriatric care management service uh, with an employee of one, and that's me. However, um, what I do is, most importantly, is work with adult children and their aging parents, or just adult children, or just aging parents, depending on what the individual needs are, and it's always around the changes and challenges that aging presents. Um, I can, my purpose is, and my tagline, which some of us have to express what we do quickly and in short, my job is to protect adult children while advocating for their parents. And my job is to take as much stress as possible relative to the caregiving, caretaking, finding the appropriate services that most adult children feel they should be doing, and should is a dirty word in my yeah, vocabulary, exactly. um, and have a huge resource list, um, including everybody sitting at this table, uh, for families, for elders, uh, to tap into community services. Okay, so you all, I mean, I think we're pretty clear about the kinds of services that you offer. And one of the things I know um, that comes into play for people is, the, is finance. So some people are on Medicare, some people are on Medicaid, some people have private insurance. Um, how, do, how do your agency, how does you know, this all affect, because I have a feeling that, I mean, I know I've had clients who have been on Medicare and they fall through the cracks because they don't have, they can't get the kinds of services that they would like to have. So just going around to each one of you, how, how is, which one, one of the above is used at your facility? Both Medicare and Medicaid. Okay. And if a person um, is not eligible for Medicaid and we help them through that process, then they would have a copay. And it can get high. And so PACE really, a lot of the focus is on um, helping the folks that are the poor, frail, elderly, although it's not exclusive to that. Okay. But with Medicare and Medicaid, the, the uh, participant and their family members can pay virtually nothing okay. for the service. Java? Java is mostly a provider of uh, information, not health services, information and other types of services. One thing that we do do that's related to Medicare and Medicaid is we do have the Virginia Insurance Counseling and Assistance Program, and we provide lots of information to people that are turning 65 and becoming eligible for Medicare initially. We also help them each year in the annual open enrollment period, and we help people apply for other federal benefits such as Medicaid. So you're much more of a resource in finding out that information. Right. Okay. And this... And in, when it comes to home care, unfortunately, Medicare does not pay for home care. They do pay for what's called home health care if a nurse is coming to visit or you're having a physical therapy or occupational therapy in your home. 
but for what Home Instead Senior Care does. That's called home care, and that's only paid for by private pay or some long-term care insurance policies will pay for it as well. Okay, so neither Medicare nor Medicaid will pay for your services? Medicaid will pay for it. We are not a Medicaid provider. Okay. Uh, we do work with the social services departments both at Charlottesville and Albemarle, uh, so if there is a need, we are one of their preferred vendors. So we do actually work with people who don't have the means to uh, pay, for, pay for it privately. Sue? My job is to help people figure out what they're eligible for okay. uh, and then direct them to the proper agencies. Okay. And most people really don't want to have to muddle through all of the paperwork and well see that the thing that I was thinking about is that you know basically if you don't I mean I think uh, not knowing many elders and having had them in my own life they'd all much rather stay home than go to some kind of facility but if I'm hearing you correctly it seems that the kind of insurances and you know those kinds of things that we have much more encourage people to go in institutions than it does to stay home and be in their surroundings. Correct me if I'm wrong, anybody. Actually, not necessarily. Oh, go ahead, go ahead. No, I said correct me if I'm wrong. Well, Medicare doesn't pay for institutions. Um, there are Medicaid waivers that will pay for a Medicaid bed in a nursing facility or assisted living, but uh, Medicare does not pay for facilities. Um, so that's a, that's a huge hole. It is a huge hole. And, and in order to qualify for Medicaid, people have to spend down to $2,000. That's all they're allowed. A monthly income. And I can give a perfect a example. A monthly income of $2,000. A monthly income of two, two. Well, it's less, actually. It's 1460 because I just went through this with my own mother, who, in fact, spent down. She can keep $2,000 in the bank and set aside $7,500 for burial, but her monthly income has to be below $1,460. So that's Social Security and whatever else there is. That's total. Okay. That's total. And you can't even pay for rent at four. I mean, that seems like an unrealistic, unridiculous. Right. So I've heard stories where people, I have not heard stories, I know this from experience from other family members, that in order to be able to, be, to qualify for certain things, people have had to give away all their assets to their families mm -hmm. and things of that nature. So they don't demonstrate a high, you know, income of one kind or another. So let's get that clear. If I want, to, if I'm going to be going into a facility, how is that paid for? I mean, you are all talking about home care here, but in the facility part of it, since Medicare and Medicaid don't pay for it, who pays for it me depends, going into a facility? It depends on the facility. Assisted living mm -hmm. across the board is private pay. Okay. There is no, there are no state or federal monies that pay towards assisted living. Okay. Actually, there um, are auxiliary grants. Well, auxiliary, okay. Yeah. okay. Which is okay. similar, what's but an it's, it's also it's, difficult. Wait, what's an auxiliary it's, grant? It's similar to Medicaid, but it applies to assisted living. Okay. So if you qualify, you can, and, and the facility offers or sets aside some auxiliary grant units, then that can help you pay for um, residents in that long-term care facility. Okay. So th I think this is the problem that pe many people get confused about. Mm -hmm. They think because they have Medicare or Medicaid or, you know, money in the bank, you know, a certain amount of income that they've invested their money, maybe they're making, you know, 3000 a month, that they have enough to help them to be taken care of in their elder years. And with all of the things that I'm, I've heard, the stories that I've heard and experienced, this is not necessarily true. You know, that what you've been, even even the insurance that, this, the copay insurance that you've, you know, maybe have had for institutional care may not be enough for that. Is, is that correct, Christine? Well, I think, that, I think we have to always look at it maybe in a different light. Okay. I think in the past, maybe Maybe people plan for um, not to live as long. Now we have to plan for longevity. Okay. There are more and more people that are living in their 70s, 80s, 90s, and well into their hundreds. The fastest demographic nowadays is 100 to 110. 
That being the case, we really have to thank financial, financial longevity as well as our own health longevity. And um, that may be a concern, like you said, which, which of our uh, social institutions are gonna help me now? Well, the question is even further, which will help us in 20, 30, 40 years from now? Right. So we, we really have to do a good job personally to take responsibility of not only our health, but also looking at possibly looking at long-term care insurance or certainly putting away money in the bank because who knows if Social Security is going to be around or Medicare or Medicaid. You know, it's, um, but at the rate these, the, I mean, if I'm not able to stay in my home because I can't walk or because, you know, I've broken hips or whatever, and I have to go somewhere, you know, even the money in the bank is not necessarily enough to take care of me for all those years. The hard, cold facts are that the government is not going to take care of us unless we are willing to use the money that we have in the bank in order to qualify as a low-income person, okay. and that's Medicaid. And I, I see another trend, though, because it used to be in, that family members took care of their elders right. in their home. Right. And then medicine came and sort of cured people and, and created these institutions where you could go and age, and families kind of got off the hook, and they got very mobile and traveled around the country. And now, because healthcare and institutional care is so expensive, and because families, I think, are realizing the importance of elders in our community, they want them back in the home. And so I think, like Sue said, the, a lot of the burden is falling on the caregivers then. It's children or spouses or um, somebody in the family that's taking care of these folks and wants to take care of them. I think that there is a, a shift now to people wanting to to do something in the home. Rather than being an obligation is what you mean? Yeah, absolutely. Based on, based on what I see in, in my practice, it's really split right down the middle. Um, it is different today, and the biggest difference is in order to survive financially, husband and wife are both in the workforce. There is no one at home to take care of mom and or dad, and they're torn. And it's finding what, the, what their options are and, and how to help accommodate them to fill the needs of their individual issue is really the challenge for all of us. What were you going to say, Christine? Uh, you know, everybody's absolutely correct. Everybody's needs are, are different. But we do find that most people really don't want to downsize from the comfort of their home and, and, and get, have to make decisions about treasures that they've accumulated over a lifetime and getting rid of pets that they've treasured and they adore and leaving a neighborhood that they feel comfortable in. So uh, oftentimes they really do want to age in place because of all those notions. And oftentimes family will come together and look at what are the possible resources financially or even amongst themselves, what can sibling A do versus sibling B? And even if sibling C lives 200 miles away, what can they do from afar? Even they can make phone calls to, to mom or dad or take care of the bills. There's all kinds of things that they can share in the responsibility of taking care of mom and dad. And maybe then it's not this overburden, overwhelming task of who's taking care of mom 24 hours a day. Maybe it's more, hey, we just need to have someone supplement us for three hours to take mom to the doctor or to go grocery shopping. Uh, so that's how people are getting creative about keeping their parents at home or, or even a spouse that may be sick. And I'd just like to speak for a, a second to the folks where the elder realizes, as do their children, that staying at home is wonderful and, and you know, having everything that's familiar around you. But as people age and they become more infirmed, it's also very isolating. Mm -hmm. And they don't have the social contacts. And the, and the stimulation that they might get if the family was able to take advantage of PACE. Or they go to, if they can be in an independent or assisted living community. 
Um, well, even before that, I mean, I have a support group at the Senior Center, mm -hmm. and it's just for talking about all these kinds of issues before they happen or as they have been happening. And one of the interesting things I've heard that I hadn't ever heard before was all these seniors who moved here to this area because their children lived here and they assumed their children would be taking care of them or spending time with them. They left their support groups in another state or another place, and now they're finding that this was not the, and you know, purchased a home here and discovered that this was not probably the best solution to whatever it is that they were doing because, in fact, their children aren't, you know, have their own families raising their own children and are not, are not spending as much time as they thought they would be. So, you know, there's, I, I think communication probably, you know, is one of the most important things among family members because every family is different. What were you going to say, Susan? Well, I was going to say a couple of things. One of them is that the government recognizes the expense involved in long-term institutional care, and they are creating new programs such as um, Medicaid waivers that for people who qualify for nursing home care but want to stay in the community and can do so have with su appropriate supports, there, uh, there are monies to help them do that. And um, the other thing that I was going to say is, it, uh, you know, we've all talked about the fact that planning is really important. And the sooner you start planning for the problems that may occur later on when you're losing independence or um, you develop some sort of illness or, or chronic condition, the more you plan in advance, the better off you are. And if you run into problems, as Christine was pointing out, let's say there are several siblings, maybe everybody has a different idea of what's best for the parent, including the parent himself or herself. That's the time to call on professionals like Sue or talk to your local area agency on aging and get some outside help. Typically, there are resources available, and there are usually some options for any family situation. So uh, call on the folks that can help you. One of the biggest demographics that's happening in the United States especially is single parenting, single mothers. And I'm, in Charlottesville alone, we're 54% 50, of the population. And I know that most single mothers live from paycheck to paycheck. And I have many of them in my single support group who are, you know, here they are alone, um, and they have not been able to save enough money over the years to be able, because they were supporting their children alone, so, you know, they get to the end of their life, and, I, and I'm sure it's not just single mothers alone, you know, we seem to be in a culture that lives for today and not for tomorrow and doesn't save, I mean, we've heard this all in the news. So, you know, we're really looking at issues here, you know, for a huge population. We're extending people's lives and yet not thinking about how it is we're going to be dealing with all those lives in the long run. And yet we don't address things like, okay, so if we have a whole community of single mothers whose children are all grown and gone, why aren't we thinking about putting them together in co-housing, you know, or multi-generational housing where, you know, there's single mothers, but here's the elder one and here's the younger one? Well, the good news is that I think that there are um, organizations in Charlottesville that are addressing just that. Uh, co-housing is an issue and intergenerational is also um, an issue. And there are agencies, uh, both public and private, uh, in Charlottesville that are addressing that. Um, but it's a huge process in the planning. Um, so that's why you haven't heard too much about it, but it really is in the works here. I was wondering, have you had any experience with people who have gotten to this stage of their life and really did not, or even those who, you know, lost it a few years ago, who lost all their income a few years ago, what is happening to those people? I mean, do you see those at Java? Mm -hmm. I do, and I see people. What, what do you do for them? Well, we help them in every way we can. Uh, you know, we, some of them have gone back to work. We have a gentleman working in our adult care center who's 93. Wow. Fortunately for him, he's able to work. Right. Not everybody is able to do that when they're an, an, a more uh, elder senior. But we help them explore every option available. Sometimes we sit down with them and we analyze ha how they're spending every dollar and see if we can help them find ways to cut their expenses back. 
So it's a, it's a case by case process. You know, the good news is we're focused on the people who are failing because they're elders. This community has an incredible number, and that's why we're a retirement destination, of active seniors with lots of support to stay active and, and to stay vital and to stay well. And wellness is very much a part of, of, of their activities today. But I'd be remiss if I didn't mention as one of the, the newer things, um, the newer projects um, in Charlottesville to address much of what we're talking about is Seaville Village. And I won't go into too much detail about that because that could be a program in of itself. But the concept of Seaville Village in order to keep people in their homes is to develop a neighborhood into a village atmosphere and on a volunteer basis, neighbor help neighbor intergenerationally so that folks can stay in their homes. And um, obviously there are gonna be people who with that kind of support and that kind of help will be able to stay in their homes. Uh, and for those that are not, well, then they'll move on to, to the, the uh, areas of health care they might need. What were you going to say? I do want to add to that. I think Charlottesville is a wonderful village in and of itself already. Yes, it is. And the reason I say that is a lot of calls that come into us are actually from neighbors who are helping a neighbor out. So uh, uh, someone who's in their 30s or 40s who's looking after their next door neighbor who's in their 70s or 80s and is bringing in their mail, doing errands for them, even cooking meals. Why we get called is because they get to the point of they can't continue to help on that kind of level. So what we always say is, you know, um, always look at who is your circle of influence. Obviously your first circle of influence that can possibly help you is your own family whether that's your children or your spouse or your extended family. If they're not available because they're not available geographically or because they're working or they've got their own children to, to deal with, then the next circle of influence could be your neighbors. And they, neighbors step up in a huge way in our Charlottesville, Central Virginia area. It's just phenomenal. Beyond the neighbors is your religious organization. They might be of assistance as well, or any other organization, social organizations that you're in. Typically, home agencies get called after people exhaust all those other opportunities. Mm -hmm. And we come in and we almost become part of the family because that's what's needed. You know, what's important is not just the tasks that could be provided, the errands, the driving people, the medication reminders. What's also re important is when someone is by themselves living alone, they become very isolated. And by isolated, I mean those four walls can get really narrow and small after a while. When you're not conversing with anybody, your world becomes smaller and you get depressed. So companionship is a huge part of it. So I always want to try to t encourage people to look at where is it that you can possibly get help. Ask questions. Java is just a wonderful resource in the community. Um, and all the information is free. So uh, if you could just encourage everyone, if I could encourage everyone to just ask the questions, there's a lot of things that they can learn from that. And we're here to empower people because knowledge is power. You are watching What Wise Women Want here on Charlottesville's Public Access, Comcast Channel 13. I'm Dr. Daria Brzezinski, and today we are talking about caring for aging parents, spouses, friends, and elders. And in our group today are an amazing group of women who participate in many of the activities and programs that we have in this community, and we are lucky in, in terms of the community services that we do have and the type of community that we have here who does support each other. To my right is Susan, oh please, Von, Von Hamert. Hamert. <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to get that right. Manager, Social Services of the Blue Ridge Pace. To her right is Susan Seidler, Manager of Community Relations at Java. To her right is Christine Shaw, Community Service Representative at Home Instead Senior Care. And to her right is Susan Lieberman, senior, senior Solutions and Geriatric Caregiver. 
So what I wanted to get into since you began to bring it up, Christine, is and I think all of you did in some way, is the caregiver person. I know myself um, sitting next to my father's bed 12 hours a day and, you know, being there for them and, you know, taking care of them. And many times they're so upset about being in that bed that they take it out on you, which makes it all the harder. Um, what about the emotional, you know, the, 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 the caregivers themselves? I mean, we've been talking about the patients and, and you know, the elders. But let's, let's talk for a little bit about caregivers, because I know myself, gosh, by the time my father died, I just needed to just do nothing for a while and just replenish my, myself. Well, it takes a toll. Yeah. Uh, it takes a health toll and an emotional toll. Um, and we try our best to let caregivers know that we, there are lots of resources in the community to help them. JABA itself has two free weekly caregiver support groups for those who are caring for aging parents. The Alzheimer's Association has a number of support groups around our planning district if the parent has Alzheimer's or other dementia. And there are a host of other support groups out there to help caregivers. So um, contact us and we'll be happy to share that information. A lot of times though, you really don't have the time to leave, you know, I mean, I know I just didn't feel like, feel like I could go out and do something else. You know, it was that I felt like I really needed to be there because you never, you know, I don't know about anybody else, but I just didn't want my father to die alone. So, you know, I was there constantly and I know a lot of other people who have felt that way as well. And so, you know, can you give people like me advice on how to, what were you going to say? Well, I, I want to just give an example of uh, a perfect analogy is the oxygen mask that comes down during turbulence in an, in an airplane ride. What do they tell you when you experience oxygen? What do Put they tell you? Put it on yourself. Right. And why do they tell you that? Because you can take care of the person. Right. It's so important to not drain your own health because you're going to be of no help to the person you're trying to right. care give for. Now, um, most of us have a hard time prioritizing ourselves in that equation because we're trying to give of ourselves to help that person. But it has to be a, a good balancing act. And like you said, your immune system was probably taking the brunt of being there 24 hours. I had to sleep hours. for a month. Right. Mm -hmm. Most people, after the, their loved one passes away, uh, they encounter a whole host of illnesses because mm -hmm. they finally are allowed to be ill themselves. Mm -hmm. But I, we always try, and I think all of us here at the table would say, it's so important to eat healthily. It's so important to take time away from that caregiving role. It's so important to meditate in whatever way you want to meditate. It's so important to not skip your doctor's appointments, and it's so important to ask for help. Yeah, that's the, that's yes. the single, yeah, that's that's the, the single mm -hmm. most difficult thing for yes. anyone to do, and it's the first thing that we all need to do right. when we're caregivers. Especially well, women. I know. Yes, I know. and, and unfortunately, true. the caregiver role oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes falls on the women's shoulders. Right. Uh, but people don't know that you might need help. And oftentimes, you might be able to get it if you just ask. Well, see, her pace, I know, is the place to go, you know, when people need a break. Right. For, but the point is, you know, can I afford that or, you know, setting, and, and you're unique because. Yeah, it's not the right place for everyone. Everybody, yes. No but, but I mean, your place is unique because, I mean, there, I, I have never seen, I, I've luckily been to everyone's place, but. I've never seen a place where people can drop, drop off their, you know, elder parent and have them participate in activities and then pick them back up again as a break. I mean, it's, tr it's a really amazing place. That, actually, Java has mm -hmm. a daycare oh, Java has as well. I thought yeah. you did. Yeah, we do. But, but that's, did. that's one of the shortages in Charlottesville relative to senior care because Pace and Jabba really are the only two places you can do that for a day. Mm -hmm. Now, some of your other um, communities, retirement communities and, and healthcare communities, do have respite apartments where your loved one can go if you need a break for a few days or a week or 10 days or whatever it oh. is. So. Who Those things. This is a respite a apartment. No, yeah, yes. yeah. The um, respite rooms are uh, apartments, and most of the most of the facilities 
well, I can think of three or four in town, and I don't want to uh, no, promote. Well, but what's a respite apartment? Well, um, Java has a list of all the assisted living facilities and nursing homes that provide respite care in the community. So, but it's a it's a place if you have to go out of town or you just need a break. Um, so it's a place where uh, there's a room, if it's available, where you can leave your senior loved one for a few days or huh. more days. Some of them have a minimum stay, some of them don't. Huh. And, it's and they'll get all the care they need. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's based upon availability of rooms. Right. So, I, and, But we have a number of assisted living communities here in Charlottesville, so quite often if you make enough phone calls, you'll find someone, some, some community that will have a room or two. That's part of the, the PACE benefit as well, is that um, it, it, respite is important and folks who've been caring for an elderly right. loved one in the home might need to go on vacation without their elderly right, parent. Right. And we encourage that. Right. So that's part of the pay benefit is then you don't have to actually have to pay for respite. It's part of the benefit because right. it can be very expensive. Right. And I do want to add that respite care can be done right at, in the home. Mm -hmm. So instead of taking mom or dad to a, a community, you can actually call Home Instead Senior Care and get a caregiver to stay and provide respite care. So the family members can go off on a vacation. And then they would privately pay Home, home, home Instead mm -hmm. to come in to take care of them. Correct. Okay. So one of the things that I noticed, uh, which is the reason why I glued myself to my father, was because he seemed to be vulnerable to all the predators in town. Mm -hmm. For example, I mean, not just in town, but on the phone, he was giving away his, you know, someone called and he gave away his credit card and that kind of information. I said, no, Dad, never do that. And then, because he, they said it was the bank, and so he just automatically assumed and trusted. And then another time, somebody came to the door and told him he needed a new roof and paid $12,000 for a new roof when he really didn't need it. And so, and I thought, oh my goodness, you know, this is really getting ridiculous. And so, those are the kinds of things many people fear about leaving, not just the fact that they might fall or, you know, the, these other kinds of things, but the fact that, you know, there's a lot of predators out there who will prey on, on right. seniors. And, you know, how can we help them in that way? Um, the important piece here is that a family member and usually an adult child have power of attorney. And if there's some dementia involved in the family or whatnot, uh, hard as it may be, and it will create some struggle uh, to have someone else pay the bills and have control of checking accounts and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And if family members aren't willing to do that, again, that's a service that's offered in the community of people who will do it. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that the tough part are for families to bite the bullet and realize what they have to do. And very often, it's tough love. And nobody likes it, nobody wants to do it. Taking but the car it, keys away. Yes, that my was mother the hard is, one. My mother is 92 years, well, she's 96 now, but when she was 92, she announced that she was gonna drive down to Florida and she hadn't driven in 20 years. And the only way that I could convince her not to do it was I literally stole her driver's license. Well, my father, so. <laughs> he, he decided he was going to drive, drive, and I thought, you know, I'm going to just drive behind him and see. And in a 55-mile-an-hour zone, he was going 25 because he couldn't see. I realized right. he couldn't see where he was driving. Mm -hmm. And here he was trying to drive through snowstorms and things of that sure. nature and windstorm like remember that day. So, you know, I can see, you know, there are, what I'm trying to bring out here is that there are benefits and drawbacks to everything. I mean, we even, ha we haven't even got into institutional care yet, and I've also had experience with that as well, which is not, I mean, in my mind, I know it's difficult to have the person stay home, but institutional care seems to be not as, you know, something we want to attract either. So tell us a little bit about, I know you all don't represent institutional care here, but you work with people in institutional care. So Well, and I think one of the keys there is if you as a caregiver have gotten to that point where you just can't care for your loved one in the home any longer and you need to put them in a nursing facility, is, is that conversation to have is you're not dumping. Right. You're there, you're an advocate, you, you be present. 
And, and so to, to encourage families to spend as much time, let go of the guilt. Let go of the guilt and be present and get to know the workers at the facility and be part of that family there. Because, you know, having someone at home is not for everyone. And we're not a, here to judge. That's not what any of us are here to do. Good yeah. point. Very good point. And the important thing is really to do your homework. And if you don't have the time or the, the, the will to do it alone. Then you call someone like a Sue Liberman, and they, I could name six other people in the community that would help. Uh, and what you want to do is, when, is go look at different places. Don't just pick one. And I tell people, don't look at more than three, because otherwise you'll be totally confused. And, and know the questions to ask, and know what to look for. And again, there are, uh, there are um, and that's Personally, the key, the I questions have, to it's ask. It's questions to ask. Yeah, that's and, and, the key. Um, sure I'd be happy to, you know, send anybody any well, information. Well, one of the, th one of the things, uh, my, my uncle, who at 90 went into, to a, ha, said to me, wow, why didn't I do this 10 years ago? You know, I mean, he was in great shape. He rode a bike 10 miles a day, chopped wood, you know, until wow. he... But when he got into the institution, it was like 20 to one, 20 women to uh. one male. So he had a blast once he got in there. So the only, yeah. go ahead, Christine. I, I was going to just so feed to on to that uh, notion that oftentimes family members might feel guilty for letting their loved one go into a facility, whether that's an assistive living facility or a nursing home. And uh, we always talk about um, guilt is not a productive thing unless it motivates you for a better usage of your time. So the guilt can be actually turned around, and if your loved one ends up having to be in a nursing home because you couldn't provide that care that's necessary to keep them safe and healthy, then the best thing to do is make sure that you're visiting them. You know, being in a, in a strange place is really hard for anyone of any age. Come with the children on a regular basis. Bring the children's friends along. Bring the pets. Decorate the room. Bring photographs. Take your loved one out on outings. Make it as much of their personal life as possible. It really doesn't matter necessarily that they're now in a nursing home. It's how you enrich their life and you continue to enrich their life. That's probably the single best thing that they could ever do for their loved one in a nursing home. Very good point. I just, um, like to, I just wanted to ask, uh, add that Java and Sue's Bailiwick at Java offers all kinds of services in helping people. I think Sue so, was about to tell us and that. And that's cool. Yeah. Well, I, I just wanted to mention that we have a checklist to help people uh, with lots of quest, sample right. questions when they're considering going into a long-term care facility. And um, we have lists of assisted living facilities, nursing homes, continuing care, retirement communities, Alzheimer's and dementia units. So all kinds of lists of community resources to help. And Java and, breaks it down to you know, who accepts Medicaid right. and who accepts uh, this. Right. So we've got uh, some information a aside from just the names and phone numbers. The other thing that I wanted to say about planning for that sort of life transition is to do it as much as possible in advance and to be sure and include the senior. And um, you know, then you're more likely that it's a successful It'll, it'll more likely be a successful transition. Okay, so how much in advance were you thinking? Uh, I'm thinking years in advance. You know, if you're still healthy, but maybe you're in your 60s, now is the time to start talking, having that conversation with your children, having that conversation with your spouse, everyone that's close to you, and beginning begin to talk about what it is that you would prefer to do if you become ill or you develop a condition that makes it difficult for you to stay at home, don't wait till the crisis occurs because we often get calls from people who, whose parent is in a facility and they cannot go home again and they have two weeks to make a decision. And that is not the ideal situation. And I, I must say that, you know, most people wait until mm -hmm. that crisis occurs before, you know, there's something about everyone not wanting to sit down and ask that ask those I mean you know everybody thinks that when when you have this conversation it's got to be about the end that which is the death part but you know with all of the Alzheimer's and everything else that's in this in this process that 
um, you know, these are the kinds of things that uh, people don't, you know, they shy away from. And I've seen so many creative solutions when people sit down and talk about things that I hadn't even thought of, you know, because they are working together, you know, in terms of creative solutions. So that's really, really an important. Chris, Chris, oh, I'm I was sorry. I just going to say I have a fun one uh, as an example. We were talking earlier about the decision about taking away the car keys, which is a difficult one. I mean, we all remember how fabulous it was when we first got our driver's license, and nobody wants to give that up. But uh, I heard about one adult child that signed uh, their parent up for taxi service. And she was so popular at her assisted living <laughs> facility, everybody else wanted to go with her when the taxi came to pick her up. So there are, there are lots of creative ways, right? Well, I, I knew a, a couple who um, they sat down with a mother, and the mother really wanted to have her things around her when she died and, you know, as, as she got older. And they created this really, they, they all researched it for a very, very long time and found this very, I guess it was a kind of a trailerish kind of thing, but like it wasn't really a mobile home, but it was just this small structure that this company in California or somewhere had created just for this purpose. And they created this on their property and brought all of Mother's things there. And she was literally surrounded exactly Exactly what she wanted, surrounded by, in her own bed, surrounded by her own things, mm -hmm. but not necessarily geographically in the home that mm -hmm. she had been in. So they call those granny pods. There you <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I, I, I didn't know what it was, but I thought, wow, what a great clever. solution! You know, what a, mm -hmm. everybody. It was a win-win for everybody. Everybody felt good. She had her own independence, and yet, you know, she was right there. And I, I mean, my grandmother. We had a duplex where when I grew up, and my grandparents lived next door. So. You know, there was always that connect, and it was great because in in our t my time, it was multi generational mm -hmm. all the time. I mean, I never knew less than three generations all the time I was growing up, and it's really sad that we don't have that. What for whatever reason? It's actually today. coming back. So yes, I think we're so seeing too. more and more of it. Yeah, I think so too. But let me add, add that in the question of when should you start that conversation, we would beg to say that you should start at 40. If you're in your 40s, more than likely you have a parent who is already in their 60s or approaching 70. So this book is called 4070 for that reason. This book is all about how to start that conversation with your aging loved ones about what their wishes are. What do they want to do if they can't take care of themselves at home? What are their wishes long term? Well, what happens if, you, if the parent can't drive anymore? How do you start that conversation? There's a million and one topics to talk about. Uh, and so if anybody wants this, this is a free resource. I was going to say, where, where can they get it's it? It's with Home Instead Senior Care. They just call our, our office. Okay. Um, the opposite side of it is 70-40. So it's the conversation on how to start it from the opposite direction. <laughs> Sometimes it's the aging parents who need to talk to their younger children about what their wishes are. So it really provides that information both ways. Well, I felt a little embarrassed because after my mom, my mom was killed in a car accident and uh, when she was much, very young. And so it left my father, who was never well a day in his life, to fend for himself. And so he found a girlfriend and all that kind of thing. And I had to sit down with my father to talk about getting married at 80. Oh, sure. So, um, which was a very interesting and in discussing social security and what happens when you get married at this stage. <clears throat> so yes, I understand that completely. <laughs> I'm sure Java has those kinds of resources mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. well. So people can pick up, you know, uh, any kind of literature from you as well as the uh, listings that you mentioned earlier. What were you going to say? Well, one of the things that we do at PACE is in the first 30 days after somebody's enrolled, we have what's called advanced care planning, and we invite the families in, and we sit down with the participant, and we find out what is important and how, what kind of quality of life are you looking at, and just asking about death and dying. And oftentimes I'll say to folks, when we talk about death and dying, it doesn't make it happen any sooner. Right. If anything, what it can do is offer you peace of mind and a longer, happier life. So we and, encourage that. And I'd just like to add that um, I know it sounds like I'm tooting my own horn, but the reality is there are families who cannot do that. They cannot sit down and have that conversation. And that's where much of my... Uh, many of my patients and clients come from, 
is because they can't do that. So they, there are folks out there who you can enlist help from to come in and facilitate that. I'm uh, sure any one of you have that as well, don't mm -hmm, you? Mm -hmm. You all have that as well. Mm -hmm. yes. in terms of, I wanted to, I wanted to talk since we get got to that stage already and don't have very much time left. So I wanted to talk about hospice. You know, in terms of helping people, and I've had, I didn't have it with my father, but I did with a friend. And how does hospice play into this? You know, and in terms of, you know, you're all uh, representatives here. How does hospice play into um, when should they be called? What what kinds of uh, services do they provide? Anybody? Well, I could start. Uh, obviously, we're, if we're dealing with a situation where someone is dying, we, we are partnering up with uh, hospice to be there. If we notice our existing client is declining, then we contact a family and we talk to them about hospice services. Hospice has to be prescribed by their physician. So um, it, it really, from our perspective, we, we certainly like to make sure that families are aware of it and then they have to take the step to talk to their physician to see if they can qualify. What is hospice, job? Um, well, it's, it's a service that's social, spiritual, and medical services that benefit both the individual who has the life-limiting illness or condition and the family. So they can come in and they have social workers, they have volunteers that come in and help uh, do everyday errands to take some of the burden off family members so that they can spend quality time with the individual who has the life-limiting condition. So um, it's, uh, it's been around for a while, but a lot of people still don't know that it exists. And most uh, hospice services are covered by Medicare, so it's not an expense that the family has to entail. Most people don't end up calling on hospice until the, the last few days or weeks of someone's life when they could have been using those services for months and months in advance. Oh, really? I mm -hmm. didn't know that. Mm -hmm. Well, what I found really beneficial about hospice was that they gave us this list to let you know these are the signs when, you know, the person is at the last stages of life. And, and I thought, wow, how ridiculous. And after reading it and then observing the person go through the stages, I thought, wow, I know, I mean, I know where this person is. And, you know, I don't want to discuss what those stages are, but, you know, when you, when you have that opportunity to observe the person and you know exactly what's happening, there's a, I mean, I, I felt freer, you know, it, it was, I had a different feeling a about what it was, uh, yeah, what it was I was observing rather than being upset with, you know, some of the things that I was observing going, okay, what's this, what's this, what's this, why you is this knowledge. happening? Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so I found that, you know, hospice was really beneficial in terms of letting everyone know what the signs were, what the stages are, and it made everyone you know, feel very differently. I think there's a misconception that hospice care or palliative care or comfort care at end of life is um, no treatment. Mm -hmm. Letting go, there's nothing more we can do, mm -hmm. so we'll put them on hospice. And hospice or comfort care is active treatment. Mm -hmm. It's very active. And like Susan said, it's active in spiritual, social, and medical. Ensuring that our loved ones are pain-free and at peace is so important. So they also contacted me up to a year later Absolutely. as the caregiver mm -hmm. grief to make grief. sure that right. I was okay and, you know, was everyone okay in the Absolutely. family. So, I mean, it was it's amazing. I had no idea. They have wonderful bereavement groups yeah. for after the loss if, if you need to, you know, some help with grieving. And, and some people have difficulty talking to their family and, and letting out the feelings they have because they're afraid they're going to say the wrong thing or whatever. So um, the other thing that hospice is undertaking at this point is they're starting a children's um, bereavement group and helping children who have lost parents or siblings or whatever, uh, which is new to our area, uh, and a huge help to parents uh, as well as the children. I'd like to say I think it's really special, all the people who, you know, you all who are all involved in this kind of work, because it's really amazing to me, you know, that 
um, especially when you know it's end of life care. You know that you have the ability to be able to you know help that per- these people in guiding them through you know this for some people really difficult stage of life. I mean, if you lose your independence, we're in an in, in, in independent culture here. Mm-hmm. You lose, grief. yeah, you lose your independence, your inability to drive. You know, your free, even your. Fr- I mean, my father outlived all of his friends, mm-hmm. so. You know, the, the fact that there are people, you all, who do this kind of work is really amazing and so supportive to people. And, you know, I know how difficult it was for me to go through it with friends and family. And I, and to have people like you who are just so um, caring and compassionate and empathetic and you know, gentle and kind, it's just, it helps the process so much more. So... What is it that attracted you into this work? Well, I think for me it was personal experience. I um, had worked in mental health and social work, and it was the death of my parents and that really intense appreciation for the help they received. Sue? Well, I worked in um, health promotion and disease prevention for many years, specializing in women's health, and I think... Probably around the time I turned 55 or so, I started thinking about aging a lot more, and that led me into uh, working in the aging field. Christine? It's, uh, I think all of us will have a personal situation that led us here, but my mother had health issues ever since she was 50, and you know we had many a scare, and the family all rallied together on many occasions to help her out. and. We're worrying about you know her passing many times. So I think when I had the opportunity to join Home Instead Senior Care, it made me realize that a lot of families are in that same predicament, and I could fully appreciate the whole range of emotions that we went through. And I guess I just really found that this was a blessing for me to be able to help people. So we have about thirty seconds. Mine started when I was six years old, sitting in my grandparents' living room listening to them and their friends tell their stories. And I realized then and there, at some point in my life, I was going to work with old people. Well, this has been an amazing program. Uh, You are watching What Wise Women Want here on Charlottesville's Public Access, Comcast Channel 13. And we have been talking about caring for elders, our parents, our spouses, and friends. And this has been an amazing group of women. We have um, Susan Von Hermit. I know I said Close it wrong. <laughs> Manager, social service at PACE. Uh, Susan Seidler from JABA. Christine Shaw from Home Instead Senior Care. And Susan Lieberman from Senior Solutions. Thank you so much for joining us. And have a wonderful evening. And join us again next week. Thank you very much.